So, uh, shall we make a start? Welcome to the Kuruza 1.0 presentation. So, as you might know, Kuruza is a wireless optical communication system for community networks and pretty much for everyone who wants to build faster internet without relying on RF. So, Kuruza 1.0 is one gigabit, 100 meter, effectively layer one bridge device which works with lasers, is eye safe and it's literally just two boxes. You put one on one building, the other on the other building, and just if you have a line of sight between them, you establish a link, which can be one gigabit um, for about 100 meters reliably in any normal weather. So the scenarios for Kuruza wireless optical system are many, but the two most convenient or common ones for uh, our applications are Say you've got a fiber connection at the end of your street, at the curb somewhere, um, your neighbor has it, something like that. Um, now, as an individual or as a small company even, you can't really afford to dig up the road and lay fiber. It's simply too expensive. Um, so you can either resort to using old infrastructure, which might be in place, or using RF. Now, that works reasonably well until you're in a very dense uh, urban environment where everyone tries to do the same. At that point, RF is congesting the spectrum and so uh, you can't get decent uh, throughputs. So with Kuruza, you can pretty much daisy chain a link from the fiber, wherever it is, from building to building, and uh, so just carry forward the capacity of the fiber optical cable. Now in community networks, we do already have some infrastructure in place, so there are wireless backbones. Um, especially here in Europe, a lot of the infrastructure is done to point to multi-point links, so, so let's say to a higher building, which has a backbone node on it. Might have a fiber connection to it or some other wireless link. Now, we do face significant spectrum congestion at that point uh, because all the links are pretty much converging to one point. So what Kuruza can be used for is having the optical link to make, let's say, the first one or two uh, jumps for 100 meters away from that central point and, and having smaller subnetworks which are on RF and, you know, we come to, let's say, a small RF cell divided uh, application where the cells are optically interconnected. Um, and the beauty of it is you should be able to build this system on your own. So just briefly, uh, you might know me, I'm Luca Mustafa, or Musti as everyone knows me online. Um, I do electronics and telecoms development um, and have founded Institut Irnestrace, so the nonprofit organization backing up also this uh, battle machine in Slovenia at the moment. And I'm a Charlotte Foundation fellow and I'm really thankful to the Charlotte Foundation because they uh, enable me to redo really open source development of Kuruza and other systems uh, for full time now with a dedicated team. I'm also starting a PhD at UCL at the moment, really on the same topic of Kuruza, just trying to see how well it works in academic environments. But I'm also a ham radio um, enthusiast and of course a part of BLN Slovenia Community Wireless Network um, and yeah, yet another reason why we are all here today. Um, and just briefly, the Institute Irna Saracha is a non-profit um, development lab which we run to push open hardware especially forward and you know, make it more reliable and better than a conventional hack or just a hobby project, but trying to push open hardware to be of industry quality or even better actually. So we really deal with Kuruza, which is the primary project but uh, as a back end to it, we are developing open source machinery such as good enough CNC, 3D printers like this, um, various tools from electronics to mechanics, and also working on DocuBricks, which is a useful source approach to documenting open hardware, which is essentially trying to come up with a good quality and standardized methodology for documenting open hardware projects. Um, I will say a bit more about these things later on. So, just briefly, uh, let's take a few steps back, uh, just so we start the story how we came to Kuruza today as it is. So in year 2012, actually in the 
winter of 2011, I have been uh, presenting at uh, Kyrgyz Republic uh, Telecommunications Forum. And the situation there is very grim still today, where Wi-Fi is not legal for public use outdoors, meaning that there is no technology available to the consumers to build any kind of uh, computer networks. And, you know, word after word, we came, okay, why shouldn't we use lasers? And this idea intrigued me very much, and I started looking into options how to go about this. So with the very affordable laser ethernet transceiver project, I figured out we can use the SFP optical module. So these are modules you plug into network switches for normal fiber connections for wireless optical applications. And this is really the enabling factor, you know, empowering us now that we can build Kuruza or similar systems with very low cost components. Um, so in about a year, there was a working prototype um, and a scientific paper outlining how this can be done. Um, and then I resorted with a small crowdfunding campaign to take this project forward, present it, and figured out that since uh, not a lot of money was available, um, I can look into 3D printing, which enables me to fabricate all the complicated parts without the need for huge expenses of tooling and pretty much external manufacturers. So uh, with that, the prototypes grew and they became more and more reliable. So with a working system, I managed to apply for the Shuttleworth uh, Foundation uh, Fellowship, which I got at the end, and now we're in the full swing of taking this forward. So just briefly taking you through the development process so you better understand how it all came to this point is it started with something like this, which is the first generation Kuruza prototype uh, with bits and pieces you find in a normal university optics lab and coupled with a few 3D printed parts which I couldn't make otherwise. So this basic system design barely worked at 100 meters, but you know, it worked. We've seen some power being received uh, and was the key motivating factor, okay, this can actually work, let's just figure out how to build a system that uh, does it reliably. So by the further development of 3D printing, um, building 3D printers, I came to try and build a design which is fully 3D printable. And this is the one we can see up here. So um, this is purely a desktop unit which um, is not actually useful for any uh, real networking, but it, uh, it has proven that 3D printing and the components you can buy from stock are firstly sufficiently sturdy and can be you know, built and designed in such a way that you can, with sufficient precision, align the laser beam to the neighboring unit uh, 100 meters far. Um, and with this motivation, the development of proper outdoor units for deployment in networks begun. So with the prototype 3, you can see that we somehow managed to pack the uh, 3D printed structure into a square tube, which you, know, you can buy from pretty much any shop, um, and making it barely, barely outdoor capable, but sufficient enough to build a link or so. And this continued with the next generation. So in prototype generation 4, we pretty much just continued uh, improving the design and optimizing the whole structure. And really finally, with the generation five, achieved a sufficiently stable design that we managed to launch also a worldwide experiment with it um, and deploy a number of useful links, which some of them are still operational today. Um, at this point with the generation five, which has been operating for at least half a year, we've seen a lot of problems that arise. We've seen which components fail, when and why. And that really gave us enough knowledge um, to go forward. But also, assembling this system has been way too complicated to be able to even document it and release it open source so someone can have a reasonable chance of reproducing it. Um, because it's not just 3D printing parts, but there's a lot of manual fixes, calibration, and things like that. So now, with a complete redesign, we came to Kuruza 1.0, which we're presenting today. Um, it is completely redesigned with a fully modular structure, and we can see it here today. So the main difference you can see is we dropped a lot of 3D printed parts um, and based the whole structure around stainless steel or pretty much any steel rods. 
um, and breaking down the system into standalone modules, uh, which we'll go through in a second. Um, so what this enables us is to have a number of, by design, not really connected parts, which are individually 3D printed and implement a function, um, and selling it in an operational system. This enables two things. Firstly, it greatly simplifies the design because all the parts just need to interface with the steel rods, not with the other 3D printed part, so significantly reducing the complexity of the printing uh, required. And secondly, since now it's fully modular, say you want to switch the motorized part for alignment here. It's just one module which you take off the system, put another one in and test it, and all the rest can stay the same. Same goes, let's say, for the core part, which is the laser transceiver, or for the pivot part and mounting uh, in front, or any other part in the system, actually. Um, and this will now enable pretty much everyone to simply build it, but as well promote research in the area, so it's very easy to start playing with different options, tinkering from a hack lab to a proper university research lab. So if we more in detail look at how the system operates, um, you can see that by using a single plano convex lens, which is up here in front, um, and an SFP module, um, the light goes out of the SFP module through the lens and we get a collimated beam, which does not change the diameter uh, with the increasing distance. Um, since the SFP modules used are bidirectional, uh, we have the communication either way through the same optical path but at different wavelengths. So we need a complementary pair of SFP modules to do that. So this is a very standard networking practice using single mode, a single single mode fiber to have a bidirectional link. Now uh, we have the laser transceiver, we're able to send the light out. Um, now we need to you know, be able to point that light beam in the right direction. So that's why uh, we have um, firstly a motorized system which very finely um, moves this precise screws so you can see some stepper motors moving screws that push against the case and actually at the front at the lens there's a pivot which you know very slightly just moves the back of the unit and the light beam just points somewhere so with that we get high precision of uh, being able to align let's say laser beam at 100 meters with one millimeter or less precision without a problem. Um, and this really enables us to lose almost no optical power for 100 meter link. Now once you're, you know, you're installing the unit, it's very hard to get the initial alignment. So we figured the most effective way how to do this is to couple the system in parallel with another green laser pointer. So inside we actually have another green laser pointer which we when we build the unit, experimentally align to be parallel with the infrared one. So you, know, you mount the unit, you turn on the green laser, and just point it so the green laser shines at the other unit on the other side. You do that for the two units, and once the infrared communication is established, we can use the information of infrared optical received power to optimize the alignment and have uh, the maximal optical uh, link margin. Um, now, how to do the alignment? We have this design of the case now, which um, with the screws you can fine tune where the unit is pointing at. And you know, just by mounting it on a pole and turning a few screws, you can get it, let's say, at 100 meters within 10, 20 centimeters range without a problem, just by eye looking at the other unit. So installing something like this is not as complicated as it might sound. Um, the modular assembly, as mentioned previously, um, consists of 12 3D printed parts on any standard 3D printer from RepRap to uh, pretty much what a normal hack lab may have. Um, has a precision alignment system which consists of commodity parts, uh, nothing custom made in design. There are four modular electronics boards, so instead of having one full control system for the unit, we have a standalone con motor controller. Uh, we have a standalone uh, circuit to intercept the communication from the SFP module and read the optical received power, a standalone uh, power module, and a standalone control circuit uh, to which we can access via the internet. 
So um, in parallel, there's a set of GPSS green laser. And also inside, we put a small um, Wi-Fi router running OpenWRT. Um, so we can get the measurements um, and control the unit as such. Now, the interesting design choice here, which is actually a market limitation, is the infrared link is completely decoupled from the management interface. Um, as uh, your data really comes directly to the media converter, which communicates with the SFP module, uh, and it's a completely uh, layer one device on the gigabit side. And in parallel, so as you can see on the back of the unit, we actually have two Ethernet ports. One is for the gigabit data, the other is management 100 uh, megabit port, which has PoE for powering the device. Although this is not ideal, it does reduce the cost and you don't necessarily need the management uh, at all times. Now, if we were to make the management a part of the device as such, we would need pretty much a switch or a router inside, which also connects to an SFP module. So uh, with that, we greatly increase the number of equipment required inside. And unfortunately, there aren't any good small form factor OpenWT routers, which would have, say, an SFP port uh, built onto them. So that would require a significant custom electronics development and with that associated high cost. So we are avoiding it at the moment. Um, by looking at the overall design, we can see that our main constraint is the SFP module. Um, the innovation is such that we use the modular transceiver as it is on the market. This gives us limited optical power, which limits the range, but at the same time, it enables such a low cost design. If we were to make a custom transceiver, which is perfectly feasible, the units would cost at least an order of magnitude more. Uh, which brings it out of the affordable range for uh, pretty much everyone in the area. Um, so with the modularity, the goal is really to introduce this to as many people as possible to start playing with it and start tinkering and coming up with better solutions than we have so far, for example. Um, so through the worldwide experiment, which we have ran for nine months now. Um, a number of deployments has been made with previous so generation five Carusa units uh, from US to Europe and soon possibly also in Australia. Um, we have learned a few things. Um, by just looking at the graph, uh, we can see we learned that thermal expansion is an interesting problem um, because you're shining the beam, the unit heats up, the sun shines at it with one kilowatt per square meter and all the parts just bent, no matter metal or plastic, and the beam shifts somewhere. Um, we've learned that rain and snow don't significantly affect uh, the performance, but fog can be a problem. So just looking at the graphs, you can see the correlation. This is from generation five. The latest one, Cruiser 1 1.0, performs much better in such situation. But still, we cannot really account or assume that the mechanical system will be immune to thermal expansion. So we are working on auto alignment algorithms. So the units will just keep correcting themselves as they heat up and cool down pretty much uh, anywhere. And that is by far the most effective way how to you know, ensure that the link operates correctly. An interesting challenge we have is that if you want to in a coordinated manner, align the units. So you move one unit and you see what change in the received power it happens on the opposite unit. You need some form of communication between the two units. Um, but since you might have lost the communication, that becomes a real problem. So we're solving that by adding a secondary communication channel, either in an optical way, uh, we're trying to use the green laser as a very low speed communication, or a low power, uh, more reliability, low bandwidth uh, wireless link, uh, which might work sufficiently. We've seen with some lowest cost modules that they weren't really okay, um, but uh, we're looking at other options. And the third option really is if you have a mesh network, you just use the mesh network for the communication uh, and to get the units aligned, um, which works perfectly in community networks at the moment. And you, we don't even need the management channel 
as such for deployments in such situations. But you know, as a standalone communication system, that should be built in. And as Julius pointed out uh, yesterday, um, it's also worth considering building backup uh, RF links into the system. From the current design standpoint, we uh, are not trying to include that because that pretty much requires just taking a commodity Wi-Fi device and coupling it into the system, um, which means that you, know, you can just buy the device and use it with the system if you need it or not. Um, there's no real need or cost-effective way how to do that today. Um, more on the problems of fog. We don't just believe fog can be a problem, but we are working actively on testing this. So, you know, just by putting units out, we observe them for nine months, and you maybe have three or four fog events per deployment of various states of fog. Depends on the location, of course. Um, the location we had is um, sometimes there were other problems, let's say thermal expansion or some random problem, and there was fog, so we can't really attribute all the loss to that. That's why we started designing a fog experiment, which is really the world's first and longest tunnel filled with fog. Simple as that. Um, so uh, as you can see here on your right, uh, the design is simple. Take a bunch of school desks, cover them um, with PVC, uh, foil and fill it with fog. So um, on the animation, you can see the density of fog being changed in the tunnel. Um, now we've done this experiment just uh, recently, um, got some measurements, but uh, we will repeat it properly to even increase the quality of results. Um, so uh, we are using the green laser as a pointing device in this case but also by standard meteorological um, ways of measuring visibility, green laser wavelength uh, can be used to determine just how much the fog attenuates the signal, and we're comparing that to the infrared in Kuruza just to correlate how much uh, loss we get. Um, and really, the main problem we're uh, having here is we managed to generate such dense fog that it's not realistically observed in any any normal environment. Um, the attenuations we're speaking about here uh, normally um, are about 200 dB per kilometer, which is a huge figure, but for 100 meter long link, this is about 20 dB, which is well within the link margin we have with the Caruso system. So the future of our uh, design is to, in this month, finish the full open source release of Caruso 1.0 and prepare a DIY kit um, so everyone who wants to build the system um, can easily get all the parts without dealing with various suppliers and trying to find the parts um, and start experimenting with it. We would really like this to be replicated by hackers, developers, or pretty much anyone interested in it and get good feedback how well this works. Um, the current design is um, in the, really depends where you get the parts, 700-ish um, euro range per link, which is still not very affordable and we're trying to optimize the cost further down. But at the moment, uh, this is where we are at. So the initial, the generation five was about 1. 5, uh, so 1.5 uh, K euros. Um, so we halved it with this generation and if we continue this space, we'll be good uh, by Caruza 2.0 or something like that. Um, we would like to expand the worldwide Kuruza experiment. That's why I'm calling or giving a shout out to you all. Um, if you've got some interested communities, researchers, pretty much anyone who would like to deploy a link um, and get, you know, spend some time with it, um, sort out a few problems if they arise and really make sure it's up and running 24 seven, we can get very good results and figure out what exactly the problems are and how to solve them. But even going further than that, we are trying to establish a global micromanufacturing network for preparing open hardware uh, through releasing open hardware uh, tool set, which is fully open. So for 
uh, let's say about 10,000 10, euros, one can start a full hack lab workshop with all the machines to manufacture parts for Kurusa or any other open hardware system um, today. So um, in just, yeah, briefly going to DIY kit, um, with that open source tool set, such as the Troublemaker 3 d printer there or any open source 3D printer, you can make all the printed parts for Kurusa. Um, we'll make available kits so you can get all other parts without having too much trouble. And in about eight hours, you can assemble the units uh, without a problem and then test them and calibrate them. So it's perfectly feasible and we've done it already to build a link in a day, calibrate it, test it and deploy it, uh, which is really the goal. On the side, we are working all the uh, machines, which you'll be able to see on the tour tomorrow when we go to our lab. Uh, so the Troublemaker 3D printer here is a uh, well-tested design, which we've been using so far to build Kurusa. We are currently working on a new version, which will be even more effective, easier to build and reliable. Um, as such, um, this is a fully enclosed 3D printer, which is a bit higher performance than your average wrap wrap. Um, and that's why um, you, know, you can print a lot of parts very fast, uh, which is good when you're making a lot of Kurusa units. Um, we're working on the plasma cutter as well. So our good enough CNC machine range starts with the plasma cutter, which is a low cost machine for cutting uh, steel, aluminum, or pretty much any other conductive metal. And the reason why we wanted to develop such a machine, which will be the lowest cost available uh, as the open source, is so we can make the cases ourselves. Um, otherwise, you need to send it out and it gets quite expensive. But um, you know, if we have a low cost machine, anyone can replicate it and start making the enclosures and all the mounting parts, which need to be sturdy and also from metal, um, we get, so we get you know, good performance out of the system. Um, the future work continues based on the same design, which you'll again see in the, uh, tomor tomorrow in the lab, uh, how it works. We'll be going to make a plasma cutter, which is this, a CNC mill, uh, which is pretty much a two by three meter machine where you can take a whole sheet of panel wood, put it in and say, make anything from uh, parts for 3D printer, uh, other tools for Kurusa, um, mounting parts, or let's say open desk would be a popular uh, choice um, by that CNC. So you can make all the furniture yourself uh, from open source designs. Um, going further from there, we are making a good sized laser cutter. Um, of course, this is all open source. Um, trying to make it even cheaper and even simpler to build. Um, 3D printer is in the development and hopefully we get to the water jet stage, which is very nice because you can pretty much cut any metal or any wood, pretty much anything you can abrase with water, pressure and sand. Um, and just briefly, I would like to mention today the state of open hardware, um, which we can relate to in electronics, which is not as bad as all other aspects of it. Um, so open hardware, there's a huge number of projects online. And most of them are of questionable quality, where it means that someone somewhere managed to build a system that works, but either from parts that they had around or with a lot of you know, small tweaks, which you can't really document in the technical drawings or whatever files you put online. Because there's usually an extensive range of further information required to build an operational system of any kind. So it's really difficult to replicate such projects. Uh, it's difficult to document them. Um, you know, writing instructables is not always very effective. Um, and from the perspective of most companies, such as let's say um, Ultimaker or any other building open source 3D printers and such machines is, uh, they are really focusing on open source as means of empowering people to modify their designs, but not being able to fully or independently replicate um, the hardware without buying something from the shop or something similar. And we would like to avoid that with uh, Kurusa if possible. Um, so 
we have started the approach of DocuBricks, which builds on the useful source idea I've started talking about a few months ago, which is creating a so-called tree structure documentation approach where we split up any system in a number of bricks. So just imagine, let's say in Curusa, one brick would be, say, um, the alignment system, which consists of motors and screws and a pivot point. Um, the other would be the electronics, um, and the third one would be the transceiver or a similar, and you know, the closure as a standalone unit. But also thinking about how we build something, how we find the parts to build something, is we've seen a clear divide between functions of a part. So let's say you want to join two pieces. You want to put a screw through them and you know, just tie them together so they don't move. So that's a function, tying two pieces together. And the implementation of doing that is taking you know, an eight millimeter screw of 30 millimeter length and drilling a hole so it fits the screw and uh, you put the parts together. But this might not be the only way how to do it, or maybe it does not matter if you need a longer or shorter screw. Um, so we are trying to build some of this logic into the documentation as such. So once you receive the documentation for Curusa, you can go to a shop, have a full bill of materials and say, okay, give me those five types of screws. And they'll ask you, right, I don't have this one, but I have a five millimeter longer screw. Normally you say, I don't know, because you really need to understand how the system works and what exactly that part does. But if we inherently build that into the documentation, you can have that small extra bit of knowledge, understanding that what the function of that part is and what you can do um, or how you can replace it without any consequences in the functions of uh, the design as such. But we are also keeping in mind that we are lazy. Simple as that. Anyone building anything is lazy. Um, like that's why we build it, because we want a machine to do work instead of us. Um, but in open source, often the case is, um, especially in hardware, software is much better. People are very lazy in tedious work of documenting something, preparing files, images, instructions, steps, uh, design files that our people can open, follow, um, and really replicate the work. So we are uh, developing a documentation builder app, pretty much a computer wizard, which tells you, okay, define your bricks, define your functions, add parts, and just add descriptions here, 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 insert photos, and an app companion on your phone, so you can easily just take a photo and it goes into the documentation and you don't need to worry about resizing, shifting photos, inserting them, and all of that, because that is a pain. With that, we're aiming to create a whole system for open hardware documentation. Also, for the scientists among us, get DOI uh, for stable system releases so they can be properly quoted in the scientific documentation um, and get the journal collaboration in. Um, that is very significant for use of open hardware in science. Um, one of the main fields uh, is bioresearch. Um, because there are a lot of machines which cost a lot if you buy them from official vendors, but you can quite easily hack together a very decent performance device at low cost. Um, and we're collaborating with a team from Cambridge to get this going. Um, I'd like to also invite you to cruise a practical session, uh, which we'll have tonight and tomorrow evening outside. Um, we'll have these units on concrete blocks, we'll place them around, establish links, uh, test it, um, maybe connect a few white bed nodes together with it, um, and you can see, try it out, get some ideas how you can use it in your networks, and of course, ask questions. So just before uh, going to the questions, uh, we just launched our new website, www.kuruza.net, 30 minutes ago, so this is officially the first presentation of it. Um, and I'd like to invite you to the web page and I'll open it for you here as well. So let's see.
Yeah, I, I know. So I'll do this. There we go. <laughs> and server not fun. Oh, yeah. I do need to connect to a Wi-Fi network. <laughs> uh, should be it, hopefully. Where's the refresh button? Anyway. There we go. Yeah, loading. Come on. Okay. Almost there, maybe not. Let's try another one. It's up? Yeah, it's photos are missing. Still loading. Wait for it. Yeah, here we go. So this will get a bit tricky for me to navigate, but anyway, let's try it. Ah, here we go. So um, we try to give as much of useful information as possible. So specs, once they load, um, we'll see them. OK, so as in pretty much any commercial system, we try to do this for our one. Um, we can have a look at the specifications. Um, which pretty much just tell you the same as for any other system. Um, you can have a look at our history, applications, how we can use it. In the source tab, we'll shortly put up the link to the repository with all the files. And just uh, as a short, short uh, demo, I'll just briefly display some instructions. Um, so we are preparing fully detailed instructions for assembling everything, including parts list in every step uh, for the system, which is divided into modules and sub-modules. So uh, the graphical interface is not really there yet. So we're currently working on this. So this is a very brief preview of um, all the parts and things you need to put the kudos together. Uh, which might seem a lot, but once you, so normally for a project, you just get a list like that. And then you start figuring out how do I put all these parts together? Where it goes what? But actually, if you have first a bill of materials for shopping, and then you start uh, assembling modules um, and have special instructions how to actually manufacture parts, so you go 3D printing, Print this part, check you know, if this holds and this is the right dimension. So you're really guided step by step to make sure everything is as it should be um, before you start assembling the whole system. For example, what I forgot to mention is every module in the system also has test cases. Let me just find one somewhere. Um, yeah, or you've seen it somewhere at some point. Uh, so a brick or a module you build has a test case so you can verify, okay, part A and B fit together. Test case is, do they move 90 degrees? Yes or no? Pretty much just tells you I've assembled something and before it's a part of a bigger system, it works correctly or not. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, let's skip back to questions and maybe we discuss a few more things. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, older prototypes of Corusa had a longer range. So you, you said that there's a margin of uh, 27 dB? Yes. Uh, so uh, if I just say I live in a, on a countryside where no fog is, uh, it, uh, the range can be longer than yes. 100 meters? Yes, you can go 200 possibly 300 meters. Um, that, and again, it depends on thermal expansion and problems you get to other, due to other factors. Um, but 100 meters is the reliable design choice which should work anywhere. Okay, okay. Simple as that. And Uh, we don't have the final calculations. 
but we are aiming to make the price such that the kit will be cheaper than if you order parts yourself and pay for individual shipping uh, for every part you need. Um, that will be currently in the 700 euro range. I can't really say uh, how much exactly because we don't have the figures yet for making the enclosures and things like that. Once uh, the plasma cutter is released, which will be shortly, uh, we'll make all the parts ourselves and see how much that decreases the cost and things like that. For one link. Yes. And just to give you a price comparison, um, the current rate for deploying fiber is about 50 to 60 euros per meter of digging up the road and laying fiber. That gives you one gigabit. Although you know this is more expensive at the moment than Wi-Fi equipment, where you can easily get a decent link for about 100 euros, um, it is still much, much cheaper than actually laying fiber. And the wireless optic technology so far, the cost of the systems have been several thousands of euros upwards uh, for industrial solutions being, let's say, 50 to 100K, which is why not many or if any community networks have a link like that. So I would say Kuruza 1.0 is not there yet, so we can really go into mass deployments of it. But it's a very large step towards that, figuring out how to improve it and just go forward with development of it. So, Please. Uh, from what I just looked at, what this module, the, 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 the TP link module cost, this optical module, uh, this is basically a link on the order of 100 euros. Yes. Uh, for, the, yeah. The, the, the 3D printed stuff, the material is probably on the order of tens of euros. Yes. Yes. So I'm wondering, do you have any idea as a path forward of making this more, more cheaply available? Yes. Question. So we have, a few, we have a few problems there. So SFP modules require very precise engineering and construction. And we cannot make our own ones because they would be simply more expensive. They're only as low cost as they are because they're produced in large volumes of millions of units. Once, you know, if there is such a big demand for Kuruza, we can easily design much better modules, which will cost about the same. But first, you know, there must be a good demand for it. Um, with regards to media converters, the story is very tricky. And if you have any good ideas and answers, uh, I'd like to hear back from you. So the media converter costs about 25 euros, the one from TP-Link, so the box here. It takes in the SFP module and gives you Ethernet out. Um, the problem with it, is it has just an Ethernet Phi chip inside, which must have the option to give you a serialized data output. Not all of them have that option, but the ones that are gigabit and have the option, you're required to sign an NDA to even build a board with it. Um, and when I last inquired to try to get those modules, um, even from a well-respected university, we were turned down by all the vendors. Because simply, we're not talking about millions of parts uh, here. And well, of course, uh, I mean, like, the total cost except for the enclosure is about uh, you know, something in the order of 100 euros. So yeah, so Yes, so you, you, know, you add 100 -ish euros for the optical part, you get 100 euros for enclosure, uh, you do some electronics and management, and you quickly add three something hundred euros per side, and um, no, the- I mostly think like the, the, the media converter is probably not the most expensive um, So none of the parts in the system is actually expensive. But it's just the number of parts you need to put together to get it working. Yes. Do you have any like, future products in mind that we can be able to use these like oils? Yeah, like so, uh, reusing the parts of Kuruza units or? Um, well, speaking about the SFE modules as such, if that's your question. 
you can reuse them in any wired optical network. Um, or you take them out of a wired optical network and put them in here. Um, as for the future, this is not exactly your question, but we're looking at swapping them out for 10 gigabit SFP modules. So we're not far from having a 10 gigabit version of Kuru's as well, uh, which you know can be months away, not much more. Um, the problem is, where do we get 10 gigabits? Um, since you know you can't really run fiber, so you can't really run 10 gigabits on a long Ethernet cable. So you need to run an optical cable to a Kuruza unit as well. So you need to double the amount of SFP modules, which again increases the cost. Um, but we are looking at ways of doing this. And as well in the future plans, we're looking at replacing the media converter with another SFP modules. Uh, so we can get an optical link to the Kuruza unit as well indoors. But you know, that does not necessarily reduce the cost because you still need the media converter at some point in the building. Uh, unless you have a switch where you plug the fire optical cable in. But um, that's a shout to you all. In how many community networks, for example, you have SFP ports and fiber optic cables available on pretty much every backbone node. Um, yeah, please. Um, well, we are using no-name modules, so we don't have a vendor lock-in problem at all. Um, so what the processor insight does, it does not touch data. Okay. It only is there to measure optical power, to blink a few LEDs saying this is, uh, like the link is up, the link is down, and contain some stuff in the flash. Once you put it, let's say, in a switch or a router, that switch can read out okay, this module is at that wavelength and uh, rated for that length and can just give you some diagnostics. This is how much optical power you're receiving. And we are using that feature to see how much power we have in the Kuruza unit as well. Um, we managed to come up with a very simple modification of the SFP module, which is not required, but it does add some extra optical margin uh, for the wireless optical application which is a purely mechanical modification to it and, and nothing else. So in software, um, we would love to look into the source code of the microcontrollers in the SFP modules, um, try to modify it so to get the link assertion, desertion levels and threshold changed. But also we can just get around that without modifying the internal electronics. Um, and there's no significant benefit potentially, um, so this would you know, increase the optical margin or anything like that. Because the electrical stuff, the power of the laser and all of that is set passively on the board and not by the processor. I read from your slides that you plan to release uh, an open set from the Borgwald experiment. And yes. Uh, so you can see on our Node Watcher website the graphs for uh, Kuruza units because every node, so every Kuruza experimental unit is just a node in our wireless network uh, for which all the data is published anyway. Um, the graphs are aggregated, so um, we have second resolution measurements for every Kuruza unit deployed for the time it was online. Um, and everyone is feel, you know, it's free to get that data. There's several gigabytes of it. Um, so we don't have it released in a downloadable version at the moment. Um, but we'll do that at some future point. If you need it and have an idea what to do with them, do let us know and you'll get them without a problem. Or if you have a good idea how to release that as well. So, please. 
thinking about earthquake environments. I, uh, yes. Um, yes, so if the earth, so the problem is not in the earthquake as such, but in the poor quality of buildings people will put these uh, things on. Because, you know, you assume a building is solid until you put a laser on it. Um, like in a normal, let's say, four or five story building, um, you get several milliradians of building sway during the day just due to the bricks he heating up and cooling down on one side, you know, just the sh sun going around it. Um, and, you know, th that is a shift of, you know, in millimeters you can easily measure it. Um, so that the auto alignment, you know, should just compensate for. Earthquake as such is a sudden disturbance to the system which will, like, the response time of the alignment is very slow, so it's in the order of seconds. So you cannot compensate with the current design fast vibrations. So during the earthquake, the link will definitely be down. But if the damage, so if the system is misaligned such that there is still enough room for motorized alignment, because there's about three degrees of motorized alignment range, um, the system should be able to, you know, search until it logs back in. This might take a while, but in theory it should come back. If it moves so significantly that uh, you know, the motors can't move to the right position, then you need to manually fix it. Um, we are looking at deploying this over a fault and wait for an earthquake to see what happens. <laughs> yeah, so if you have locations like that in mind, Feel free to let me know, um, and you know we'll try to make it happen. We have agreed many earthquakes, uh, you know, every week. We have. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Just uh, coming back to what you said, if it's completely misaligned, but within range, how long does it take? Um, hours, days, weeks, years. So, so you mean the alignment? Yeah. Um, alignment takes an order of so. Uh, if you move from left to right for the three degrees, it takes a few minutes to scan the whole range. Um, so, you know, you have two axes, so let's say worst case scanning could take maybe 15 minutes or something along the lines. Um, the Kuruza, Kuruza aims for a consumer application where you have 99% availability annually. So this gives you almost three days of downtime, uh, worst case. Um, so, if, you know, if you have a few occurrences where the link is down for a short period of time, that's still much less than the average service provider uh, to a consumer, so um, you're kind of used to that. Uh, if, you know, if you want higher availability, there are systems you can pay enough and they will sort everything out for you. Um, and not trying to make something perfect here, but just good enough and sufficient low cost has some drawbacks in the design. Any other questions? Do you have ideas for increasing the range to kilometers? No. It's, it's okay. in, a, like, in a reasonable cost range, at one gigabit, it's not possible. At low rates, at low rates say 50 to 100 megabits, there are possible ways of using LEDs as transmitters, so as high power arrays that could do that. Um, there's a whole bunch of other problems associated with that, but it would definitely be an interesting research um, or development actually task trying to create an LED-based SFP module. Because currently everything is laser-based. With LEDs you can afford higher power. Um, Bandwidth is somewhat limited, but you know we should get to 100 megabit-ish range um, without a problem. I just want to say this is so cool. <laughs> 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 when I first started building with radios, it was about 40 grand at the end. You needed a vessel that was 80, like one of them, and it's gradually dropped to where it's two dollars a chip or less. And I, you are getting in something that may end up falling. Very little to connect up an entire community at very high speeds without taking out the streets. Uh, 
that would be awesome. <laughs> I really hope for it. Can you please uh, announce again uh, the workshop today? Or when will it be? Um, so pretty much whoever's interested, just find me and we'll work out the time. We'll just set up Kuruza units and I'll kind of guide you through it. You can have a look at all this. Uh, you know, all the things will be here the whole week. Just have a look at them anytime, ask questions. Um, you can see a part printed for Kuruza, for example, here. This was just printed during the afternoon. So um, it's still warm, nice and fresh. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the part that houses the SFP module here. So I'll just peel off the retaining edge, and yeah, this is this is the part that fits here. Um, so within about 12 hours, um, on a decent printer, you can get all the parts for one Kuruza uh, unit. So in the day, you can print all the parts for Link. That's what we're aiming for at the moment. Like one day of printing plus one day of assembly, you can have everything done. Yeah. Do you have any plans to do repeaters? Well, repeater is just one more unit. Yeah. Simple as that. Do you have any plans to do like, um, kind of design parts for that? Well, you know, like really, repeater is just this unit and another unit connected back to back. The only optimization which we can do in this case is getting rid of the media converter, which we will do any case when we will have the optical input uh, to the Kuruza unit. So that's something we're working on at the moment, and you know it will be done shortly. Um, but by that, you know, you drop a price maybe for 60 euros or something like that. Uh, it does not make a significant dent into the cost of the system. Um, because you need some extra electronics to power it and all that. Um, yeah, but you know, you need standalone units because you actually need to move and point the beam in the right direction. Um, there is no real way of you know, spreading the optical power out. Any other questions? Otherwise, I believe we're done for today. Thank you very much.